Welcome to the Science of Getting Faster podcast, where we cut through the headlines and talk directly to the researchers to find out what their studies suggest, what they don't, and where the research is going. My name is Nate Pearson. I'm the CEO of Trainer Road. With me is Trainer Road's head coach, Chad Timmerman. Hi, everybody. And today we have Dr. Tim, who I'm going to say it wrong again. I just asked you, Podlogar. Yeah, that's perfect. Hello, everybody. Hello. Thank you. So, Tim, uh, or Dr. Can I call you Tim? Because your name's hard. Or I call you po Dr. Podlogar. I'll call you Dr. Pologar. I'm sorry, I should not, I should just get it right. Dr. Pologar, uh, what's your background? What university are you from? Let's, let's hear some history before you, before we jump in this study. Just call me Tim. Um, yeah, okay. I come from Slovenia. That's the country where Primoz Roglic um, and today Pogacar are coming from. So it's like a hot country in the, um, the cycling world at the moment. Um, my background is like, I studied um, kinesiology at in Slovenia, and then moved to uh, the UK, to the University of Birmingham, where I did my master's first, and then I finished my PhD uh, just this past summer in the same university as well. And I was mostly interested in exercise metabolism and sports nutrition, um, and that's also what my PhD was about. Um, I'm currently um, a researcher here in Slovenia, working at um, one of the institutes, uh, looking at exogenous ketones and hypoxia uh, and the performance. We are still about to start that study. Um, I'm going also to be a lecturer um, in exercise physiology at one of the universities. And I'm also working with athletes as a part of a new startup that we are working on. It's a human performance center here in Slovenia. Um, so I'm trying to be involved both in the practice and also the science. So for those, um, everyone who's listening to this and you're on Instagram, you should follow Tim because Tim drops like studies and information all the time in your stories. I love it. You're like my favorite Instagram account. Can you say what your Thanks. Instagram account is? Uh, it's Tim Podlagar. So it's the name, first name and the surname. Um, How do you spell Podlagar? Podlogar. Podlogar. But just... <laughs> <laughs> it's Podlogar because it's easier. So P O D L O G A R, just yes. for people listening. Great. Okay. So that this we have you on here, um, and you're in a very hot area too. People love exercise and metabolism right now for like the last five years. It's everywhere. I think a lot of people uh, have like camps they kind of sit in and they talk about no, this is the way. No, this is the way. So having the studies that actually, um, uh, you know, try to show something is very very interesting and. That's why we have you on the podcast. So this one, let's not get to the results to the end, but this is the, the title of it is Impact of Post-Exercise Fructose Maltodextrin Ingestion on Subsequent Endurance Performance. So what were you trying to find out with this study? So this was a follow-up of a previous study that we did in our lab. So let's first um, dig into the background uh, a bit. Um, so we have um, three different monosaccharides, which is glucose, fructose, and galactose. There is very little known about galactose, so let's put this one aside and let's talk about fructose and glucose. Um, glucose can be utilized by most body cells. So we are talking about like glucose in the blood all the time, like five millimoles uh, is the normal concentration of the glucose in the blood. And it's really important for the brain. It's really important for uh, muscles. But then we also have fructose. Um, and fructose cannot be um, utilized by most uh, body cells. So um, fructose first needs to enter the liver where it's metabolized. Um, the most important pathway or like uh, what happens with fructose is um, it's converted to glycogen during the recovery, liver glycogen, and part of it goes out of the liver in um, the form of um, glucose or lactate. So if you're actually eating uh, candies that has uh, have a lot of like fructose um, in them, um, you're going to actually increase the lactate levels even at rest, uh, which is kind of really interesting uh, thing. It's not, it doesn't happen only during exercise, but also at rest. Um, and studies in the past have shown, um, actually my supervisor um, in the early uh, 2000s, or I think the study was published in 2008, that when you combine glucose and fructose during the post-exercise recovery period, 
you get the same um, amount of uh, glycogen, muscle glycogen replenishment after the um, exercise. So you deplete first, uh, first deplete um, glycogen stores, so the carbohydrate stores within the body, and then <clears throat> you do a repletion um, by having loads of carbohydrates in the subsequent few hours. And they have found that um, the rate of muscle glycogen replenishment is the same uh, whether you ingest only glucose or glucose and fructose. Um, then <clears throat> the other studies um, found out that uh, when it comes to liver glycogen, which is the organ that uh, maintains the normal um, glucose concentrations in the blood, um, the liver concentrations were um, much higher after the ingestion or co-ingestion of fructose and glucose because fructose first needs to go to the liver be metabolized there um, whereas glucose most of it goes uh, straight to the muscle so um, in the end if you're ingesting glucose and fructose uh, you end up having uh, more glycogen stored um, especially in the liver um, and there is no chance in the muscle so the question was, does this translate into improved performance? So like that would be really a um, cool thing to do, especially like uh, riders that um, train um, day to day and they have a limited amount of time between uh, two training sessions. That's probably like <clears throat> very interesting for uh, triathletes, but also like for elite athletes, um, like Tour de France riders, because the timing between two sessions is pretty short. Um, and um, we wanted to see if this translates into improved um, exercise capacity or performance. So the first study was published um, a few years ago by our group, where we asked runners to run until exhaustion at 70% of VO2 max. So they were running for um, like quite some time. Um, and by the, by the end of this, um, after the end of this exercise, about number one, uh, <clears throat> we fed them with uh, 90 grams of glucose only or glucose and fructose for four hours, um, 90 grams per hour. And then we asked them to run again until exhaustion. Um, and in the group, I mean, in the condition when they got um, a combination of fructose and glucose, um, the time to exhaustion was much greater than when they only got um, glucose. Um, and we kind of, this was kind of the first study showing that there might be some benefit uh, from co-ingestion of glucose and fructose. However, the problem uh, with that study was that we were uh, doing the exercise capacity test. So how much, uh, how long can you go at a certain intensity? This is not what happens during the race um, because in the race you have to cover certain distance. Um, so it's a completely different story. Um, so we kind of wanted to really um, improve the study design um, by measuring performance. And the other thing we were interested in was also um, substituting um, running with cycling because it was thought that perhaps um, the fructose glucose combination was better because there was less gastrointestinal discomfort. Uh, because you know, like runners um, experience much more, the, the discomfort is more prevalent among runners. And we thought uh, that um, the better um, like exercise mode um, to investigate the pure effects of um, like ingestion of different sugars um, is cycling because the prevalence of gastrointestinal discomfort is much lower. So we did this study. Um, and in the meantime, actually, uh, the first study was kind of replicated by the um, researchers at University of Bath, where they like replicated um, the results. They got much um, better or higher time to exhaustion in cycling. Um, so they did the same, exactly almost the same study, but um, not in running, but in cycling. Um, and they found very similar results as we did. Um, but in the meantime, we were doing also an hour study, which was a bit different in protocol. So we used, um, instead of um, time to exhaustion as a glycogen depletion mode, we did a high intensity interval training session. So it was like a really intense um, I, two minute. Tim, I want to walk you through each one of those because I want to get into very specific parts of it. But you said a whole bunch of really important things there. So I want to wrap, I want to, I want to like pull out a few of those. One you mentioned about gastrointestinal 
issues. And yeah. this podcast is probably mostly cyclists from train road users, but there are probably hopefully runners and rowers and all sorts of other type of endurance athletes. And you hear a lot about people say, Hey, I just can't take in that much carbohydrate while I'm working out. And usually what you see is people do, you look at what they're eating and it's mostly glucose. And if you're doing like hundred grams of glucose in general, a lot of people have issues with that. And what you're saying is that if you combine it with fructose and there's a ratio, and I think we can talk about ratios, actually just tell us, is there a ratio between glucose and fructose that you think is better for um, people's stomach? Um, yeah, I think the current research indicates that the best ratio is close to unity, a bit more glucose um, than fructose. Um, but yeah, it's kind of like during exercise, we know that you can actually only utilize up to like 60 or 66 grams of um, glucose based carbohydrates per hour. So glucose is also like uh, behaves in the similar way as maltodextrin that is usually present in most um, energy drinks or um, gels. Um, and then we have uh, fructose as well. And the difference between glucose and fructose um, here is that um, the transporters that transport these sugars from the intestine into the bloodstream are different between uh, are different for fructose and glucose. So when you saturate the transporters for glucose, and this happens at like 60, 66 grams um, per hour, um, you can still utilize those transporters for fructose, and you can actually uh, probably uptake more of this sugar. And that's why um, energy gels, um, some certain energy gels. Um, like power gels or Morton um, also have fructose in their products because um, this can help with the absorption. And they're also like usually friendlier to the stomach. So you're getting power from two sources at once, pretty much. Yeah. So I have a question too. This is a little bit off topic, but no one's been able to answer this question for me. The 66 grams per hour just showed research. People are such different sizes. You take a five foot, 100 pound woman and a six, five Michael Phelps, who's training a whole bunch. His intestines are bigger. I'm six, six myself. Is it the same if I'm a little, if I'm, you know, hundred pounds versus if I'm 200 pounds, the 66, do we know that? Has there been research around that? Um, not really. So we also, we only have indirect data. So Aske Yeokinjuk, um, was, um, performed, like he performed many studies looking into this, um, into this like topic about exogenous carbohydrate oxidation rates. Um, so how much carbohydrates that you're ingesting, you're actually oxidizing. Um, and he did many studies uh, in Birmingham and he pulled up, um, the data from all of those studies together and found no relationship. But uh, we have to know that there was no specific study. So, for example, um, Matthew Heyman, uh, he's a really tall guy. Um, he can produce a lot of power, um, can probably, I would imagine, uptake and utilize more carbohydrates than, I don't know, Naira Quintana, um, a really small exactly. tiny guy. Yeah, and uh, Heyman's like 180, right? Like, and Quintana's like 130, maybe. So the amount of just power outputting, you would think that if you're limited by the 66, that um, all the big people would just drop off, right? Because they couldn't be restoring their glycogen in these bigger races. Okay, so that's, that's something else that we can, uh, that'd be a really cool study, by the way, if you get someone, especially as someone who is really taking a lot of carbohydrate, because I wonder too, if there's something in the gut that changes, if you're habitually taking in a whole bunch of glucose on rides over many years. But my next question is, if you do take more what happens? So let's say like you're just a regular person and you start taking in 200 grams of glucose per hour. What happens? So if you only absorb 66, what happens to the rest? It's just sitting there and waiting um, for the end of exercise. And then it will just um, probably be transported at the time. Um, so for example, I was doing a lot of experiments on my own in the lab and I was um, doing once a ride with 120 grams per hour. Uh, and that was kind of a lot. It was one to one ratio of fructose glucose, um, which I thought was optimal. And I think I reached like 1.6 or 1.7 grams per minute oxidation rates. Uh, so that's way below 120 grams that I was um, ingesting per hour. Um, and at the end of the ride, I wasn't really tired when I stopped. I wasn't craving food. 
although I was cycling for three hours at 250 watts. Um, I was just normal. I just uh, went to the office and started working because I didn't feel tired at all. Um, and I think like the blood glucose was normalized as soon as I stopped, um, just because um, there was still plenty of carbohydrates available um, for me. And yeah, over the course of that, you didn't suffer any GI distress. No, and no, is that none because whatsoever. Would that be because you're typically, I mean, you, you, you're used to taking in high carbohydrate intake over the, I mean, how long have you trained your gut to be able to respond to and tolerate high levels of gluc or carbohydrate? I never had any issues with that, but we have to know that I was uh, riding indoors on an indoor trainer. Um, the room was well uh, um, air conditioned, so the temperature was like stable at 18 degrees, the humidity was really low. So okay. I don't know what would have happened um, outside, but I was doing a race last year um, and I was ingesting like close to 90 grams per hour um, over the course of like five hours and I was perfectly fine as well. Um, so I kind of, because I'm a nutritionist myself, I probably uh, kind of think about this and train the gut properly. Um, but yeah, um, I never experienced any issues um, with that discomfort. So I'm probably not really the best example um, for this. Your machine. Can it happen though that you get diarrhea from it and it just gets excreted? Oh yeah, we, we, we know at least two uh, examples of this. And first one is um, last year, Primoz Roglic had issues. And then a few years ago, Tom Dumoulin as well. So uh, they were both blaming sugars. Uh, although I think it wasn't about sugars, it was mostly about improper um, intake of sugars. Hmm. So the, um, another thing that you said is, it was very, very interesting is, so in the previous studies, this combination of glucose and fructose, it extended the time to exhaustion. So meaning they ride at a certain wattage, which is a yeah. percent of VO2 max, and then they lasted longer than not. And I, I guess that has to do with muscle glycogen. Is that right? I'm not sure. I, I think it doesn't because um, muscle glycogen should be the same at the start of the ride. Um, at least that's what the previous research is actually showing. And the only difference uh, between the two is actually the liver glycogen uh, stores. Um, so the glucose levels could be maintained, um, normal glucose levels could be maintained for longer. Uh, but at least in uh, the latter study, so the study by, uh, in the, from the University of Bath, they didn't find a uh, drop of glucose levels when the exhaustion occurs. Uh, so we are not really sure what happened. Also in the first study, in our study, um, in the end, we saw a drop of um, carbohydrate oxidation. So increasing fat oxidation rates. Don't drop give it away. <laughs> <laughs> Building some suspense here. Tim, yeah. I have a question then. It, so what, what's the potential performance benefit of replenishing your liver's glycogen stores? I mean, aside from distributing the carbohydrate in such a way that it doesn't create GI discomfort, you know, splitting or adding in a bit of fructose to the glucose. What are we looking for in terms of performance? Is it cognition and, and then therefore RP effects, motivation? Because isn't most of the glycogen that's stored in the liver kind of sequestered for brain functionality and internal organ function and, and, and that sort of thing rather than muscle contraction? Um, yeah, that's partly true, but we have to know that um, like glucose that is circulating in the bloodstream also gets yeah. uh, used uh, by the muscle. Um, okay. And we know from like really long time ago, like early 90th, uh, 20th century, that when the blood, glu blood glucose levels drop below like three millimoles per liter, um, people get fatigued. Um, so liver is important. Um, okay. So then, then uh, in this study, we're looking at just performance. So it's, uh, we're going to talk about it, but it's basically a regular TT. So you're saying that um, with the studies, with the data section today, suggest today is if you're doing two longer workouts, or maybe we're going to do Cape Epic this year, or if you're doing the Tour de France, or you're doing a stage race where it might be exha exhaustion is your limiter, that doing this probably is a, is a benefit. But what you're looking for is if you're going to do a, a TT later that day, or like, a, like an hour long TT or 30 minute TT, right? And to see if you can actually put out more wattage for that time where it's not an exhaustion as your limiter, but actual maximum power output. Is that correct? Yeah, but um, I think 
our um, study needs to be interpreted in a certain way. So the results are not clear cut. Yes. And we can't really say that um, like for, for, for a time trial, uh, fructose is um, not the best way to go for. Um, so that study, so after the glycogen depletion in the morning and four hours of refeeding, what we did was first had one hour of steady state exercise. Um, that was kind of zone two. Um, and it was a fixed intensity so that we were able to actually see what happens with the metabolism, like carbohydrate oxidation rates. We also assessed um, how much of the carbohydrates that were ingested during the recovery were actually utilized in that hour. And then we had a 40 minute long time trial. And Tim, um, prior to that, you really ran them down. You had a protocol that really tapped their glycogen stores. Correct? Yeah, I'd like to step back one step before that of why test because how do you even get zone two on these athletes, right? I mean, do they tell your FTP? I think you used VO2 max. And why did you use that? So it's a, um, yeah, we usually like do what max relative to what max in, with, at least in this study, we used a what max, which is like, um, how high, um, you can get on a ramp test during a VO2 max test. Um, and this is just what everybody's using these days in the research. Still, I think it's, this is really outdated. Um, and it shouldn't be like used. It should be uh, the intensity should be set relative to like probably critical power or trash um, functional threshold or lactate threshold, whichever like let's say physiological or um, threshold um, rather than like um, end power of the ramp test. Um, They're I using the highest three minute average over the over the course of a ramp test, right? Um, it was actually. A, like the last completed stage plus, plus a fraction of the um, one that was, yeah, failed. Okay. And that's where you started 100 watts and there's a, a stepped increase yeah, yeah, every yeah, so yeah. many minutes. 30 watts per minute. Yeah. yeah. Uh, we increased by 30 watts every two minutes, I think. Two minutes, right. So the next thing I want to talk about, which Chad was just alluding to, so now we know what zone you want to, what water you want to put at, people at. The, the, the protocol for glycogen reduction this sounds pure evil. Um, I think we could build <laughs> this on the awful. road, by the way. <laughs> but uh, what is this, this protocol that you use to like first, because what you first did is get all the glycogen away, right? Yeah, exactly. So there's something to replenish. Yeah. So um, the protocol is like a high intensity interval training session. So it's 90% um, of um, this uh, watt max that we achieved during the um, graded exercise test. Um, so that's probably corresponds to like uh, way above the FTP, um, just to put the numbers into perspective. So it's two minutes on this intensity, then reduced to um, two minutes at um, zone in zone two. So there is no real rest actually. Um, so it's still pretty hard. Um, and then you go for as long as you can, two minutes on, two minutes off. Um, and once you cannot do like this um, 90%. Uh, watt max anymore. Uh, we reduce the intensity to 80% for two minutes, two minutes on, two minutes off again, um, until you cannot go anymore. And then we reduce the intensity to 70%. And when you're, um, you can't sustain the 70%, which is usually um, already below the lactate threshold or the functional threshold power, um, which is like in the sweet spot zone somewhere, um, we just stop because they can't even cycle at 50%. That's really hard. Um, some studies actually use even 60%. So they're actually both, um, the both intensities are actually almost in zone two um, and they just can't do any more. But we found that um, it's pretty um, similar in terms of the duration and the glycogen depletion. Um, so the effects are yeah, pretty yeah, similar. How how much glycogen actually gets depleted? Because it, it doesn't ever go down to zero, correct? Oh, no, it, it never goes to zero. So um, it depends from study to study and participant to participant. So um, in my opinion, uh, the more trained you are, um, the higher the concentrations on the beginning of exercise, um, and also the higher they are uh, towards the end of um, exercise bulk. But you deplete them like for more than 50% um, and you're really tired by the end of exercise. Um, whereas like untrained participants can go really, really low, but their starting concentrations are low as well. 
Uh, we have to know that like massa glycogen, it's not like just one pool of this uh, glycogen, but we have these um, different pools of glycogen. So within myofibrillar, um, so we, um, yeah, intramyofibrillar, intermyofibrillar, so within um, different parts of the muscle tissue. Um, and we usually the analysis is done just on the whole level of the muscle rather than um, like localized um, depletion. And we don't really know probably the most important pools, the, the ones that are like determining the exercise capacity performance are depleted almost completely, whereas the others are still there, um, but they're not helping with the um, energy availability. So the- And then Tim, is it also true that highly trained athletes can run their glycogen stores down further than untrained athletes? I, in my personal opinion, no, because no. Um, there is this hypothesis of glycogen threshold uh, that they have to go below 300, um, doesn't matter the units. Um, I think I'm pretty well trained athlete, um, and I've done three glycogen depletions with um, muscle biopsies at the end, and only during one was I able to go below 300. Mm. Um, and there are other studies as well, um, kind of indicating that this might be the case. That's my personal okay. view, but um, yeah, it's pretty difficult to get really, very low. Side note, sure. thanks. Do muscle biopsies hurt a lot? <laughs> <laughs> uh, sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> Can you train the next day or that day, or are you out for a while? Oh yeah, uh, my last PhD study was, uh, so it was a really, really similar protocol. So we did the glycogen depletion um, straight to the table for a bi muscle biopsy. Um, four hours of recovery, drinking uh, galactose and different sugars. Um, and then another biopsy straight on the bike and cycling for another hour and a half. See, Chad, it's not that bad. We okay, have a side, uh, side note to a side note. Does that mean you're investigating galactose also? Um, yeah, there, there is one study already published about lactose and there are a few coming up, uh, coming out about galactose as well. Um, okay. Sometime Great. in the future. Yeah. We've done uh, blood lactate tests on our other podcast, Ask a Cycling Coach, and Chad and I are very like textbook, which I think, what is it, lactate or a lactic threshold is like four millimoles, right? Yeah, we're, yeah. Yeah. And um, the other host, Jonathan, he's at like 22 or 18 or something, and we want to see if he has higher fast twitch or not. But there's this, this fear that uh, it's like a surgery and that you're out for like weeks and it's going to be a whole bunch of pain and you're going to cry. That's so, not my fear. Uh, Tim's done it twice. Simply, What's painful? your fear? It's just that it hurts. Tim, Tim did it two in a row. Be yeah. tough. You're a cyclist. Should Tim's be tougher than I am. <laughs> it's perfectly fine. I mean, um, in uh, Scandinavian countries, they are uh, most experienced in this biopsy technique and they're doing crazy uh, studies in terms of how many biopsies they're doing and um, everybody survived so far. So uh, well, we're, we're going to hop on a plane once COVID's open. It's weight loss too, right, Nate? It's weight? It's weight loss. <laughs> totally is weight loss. Um, okay. So during this glycogen reduction, which is before, because you want to figure you want to have some kind of room to put in this, these extra carbs. Um, did they, so I'm guessing during that time, did they just drink water or did they have any kind of carbs during the yeah, glycogen I think reduction? They only had water. Um, okay. although I think I have a hypothesis that you could actually um, reduce the glycogen concentrations even further if you had um, glucose around, um, just because you maintain the blood sugar levels um, and you kind of still burn the uh, muscle glycogen. Uh, but that's just a hypothesis of mine. Is that how you got your lowest glycogen levels? No, no, it was oh, okay. purely water, but so. I, I agree with that. It's like at the end of Leadville, when you're taking carbs the whole time, that's when you feel the worst and you can't move your legs because you get to go lower. So another side note. And then, okay, so then we did this. You, I'm sorry, you did this. And then you gave people, it was double blind, right? The, yeah. And what, what does double blind mean? That means that uh, neither the participant or the researcher that is present in the room with the participant, um, they both don't know what the um, pro. I mean, the the composition of carbohydrates actually in this uh, case was. Um, so, another researcher from the like from the school uh, mixed the sugars and just gave us um, the drink, and we just gave it to participants. 
That's so you don't influence the outcome, right? The person goes, exactly. oh, I'm getting the super fuel. I'm going to do better. So then, for instance, the first study we did wasn't double blinded, was only single blinded. So the, only the participant didn't know. And this was another factor that we wanted to kind of improve. Um, and we decided to lay double blinded. So Awesome. And then um, how much, how many carbs were in these bottles? And then what was the, what did you put in each bottle and what were the ratios? So um, in this study, uh, we did uh, relative uh, to body weight, uh, the amount of sugar. So it was 1.2 grams per kilogram of body weight um, per hour. Um, it was 1 to 1.5 1 1 of um, like 1.5 was maltodextrin um, and one was uh, fructose. Um, so a bit more uh, glucose-based carbohydrates than it was fructose um, or purely like um, yeah, glucose or maltodextrin. Um, this was quite a lot of sugar and it was just dissolved in water and given um, in even portions every half an hour. Um, so they were just drinking water, sugary water basically. For four they hours. did that for four hours. Yeah. For, for four hours. So, um, and the other one was dextrose, dextrose and maltodextrin. So de dextrose is actually the same as glucose. So um, you never get glucose in research. You always get dextrose. Um, so that's probably the same. Also like the difference between uh, maltodextrin and glucose in terms of metabolism, there, are, there aren't any differences. The only difference is probably um, in the taste. So glucose is sweet, whereas maltodextrin is not. Um, so that's why we used maltodextrin that the drink wasn't as sweet. So, uh, for me, I'm 84 kilograms. That would be a hundred grams of sugar per hour. So, uh, every 30 minutes you would have given me 50 grams in a drink and I was supposed to drink that 30 minutes and that was over four hours. So I would have got 400 grams of carbs, correct? In one of these mixes, either fructose and maltodextrin or dextrose and maltodextrin. One is the fructose and glucose. Another one is just glucose. Um, yeah, yeah. Correct. Okay, cool. And then, then what did you do? Um, then we put people in the bike and um, ask them to ride in zone two, let's say, um, at a fixed intensity for one hour first, um, during which we assessed um, like the, what happens in blood. And also like we um, try to calculate how much of the carbohydrates that were ingested during the recovery uh, were actually utilized during exercise. Um, and we did that um, by using um, stable isotopes. So it's a special technique that's pretty well widely used in the research. Uh, it's a pretty simple once you uh, figure it out how it works. Um, and then after this one hour, uh, we asked them to do a time trial. Um, so it was like a certain amount of work, like a kilojoules that has to be completed. Uh, participants only had the information about how much of this distance they have left. Um, so no like power output, real time power output, no information about heart rate, no music was allowed, uh, no conversation, no talking, nothing. Uh, it was just purely them, them and um, yeah, the race. So um, to tell, describe that isotope thing because I thought it was pretty interesting. And what what is that protocol and what are you trying to find? So um, carbon um, atoms um, have a few isotopes, so there are two. Like one is uh, there are two major stable ones. This means that they have different amount of uh, different number of protons, so their mass uh, differs. Um, and there is one that is um, has twelve protons that is uh, most um, widely um, used in the nature. So it's like ninety nine point nine 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 percent of all those uh, carbon atoms. Uh, is actually with 12 protons. Um, there is a really small fraction of um, carbon atoms with higher number of protons. Uh, so um, we used um, like different combinations of these um, carbohydrates with different carbon atoms so that in the end we were able to, um, we were collected the expired air, so the CO2 carbon dioxide, and these carbon atoms actually are coming from carbohydrates um, so 
the ratio um, actually between 12 and 13 C carbohydrates and tells us, can tell us um, what carbohydrates were used during exercise because you kind of assume that the stored carbohydrates um, were of 12 C origin. Let's simplify things. And the carbon uh, atoms from that were ingested uh, were 13 C. Um, so we're a bit heavier. And then we were able to like quantify the amount um, the, of carbohydrates that came from each source, if that makes sense. That's so cool. Perfect. Okay, so, so the TT, I did some math on myself and I'm thinking for me, um, maybe around 655 kilojoules. Does it sound pretty close? About 650 kilojoules for a rider over? Yeah, I think so, yeah. Yeah, somewhere in there. And it's going to depend on how fit that person is, how big they are. But that is probably 30 to 40 minutes for a rider, correct? Yeah. To put it out at an all out max. So they're on these bikes. And two, for the power output, for everyone that's interesting or interested, they use these like special scientific bikes that have a power meter. It's like a stationary bike, right? And then you adjust it and it has a power meter built in that's very sensitive, hopefully more sensitive than uh, our, our like trainers. <laughs> <laughs> and then they all jump on that. And that's how you, you get like a very accurate uh, power measurement. So what were the results? So we found completely no difference between both conditions. Ah! <laughs> <laughs> what? <laughs> womp, womp. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we were really surprised to see that, um, especially after like the other two studies saw really nice um, improvements in exercise capacity. So we really didn't get and understand what was going on. Um, so we have a few theories what might have happened. Um, but yeah, it was really interesting to see these results. And uh, we were kind of yeah, disappointed to see that there was no improvement with fructose. And Tim, uh, you didn't even... I'm sorry to cut you off. You didn't even see any difference in the, the combination of sugars in terms of GI distress either. No. But was this was done in a lab and not on the, the hot roads of Kona, for instance. Yeah. So what was really interesting with this discomfort thing was that uh, so the first time that participants came into the lab, we did a familiarization session. Um, so before the real um, experimental sessions, they like try the protocol and during this familiarization session we only gave them like fructose um glucose and maltodextrin so the worst possible um carbohydrate mixture um and what was interesting to me was that at least like two or three people out of eight uh experienced a lot of discomfort um so they were struggling to be on the bike for the hour um, and then the time trial. Um, but that only happened during the familiarization session. So I, I don't know, maybe it was the one session was enough to train the gut. Um, but yeah, uh, we didn't pick anything then on the GI distress um, later on during the experimental session. So, uh, so I don't know whether this was just a one time thing or was it something to do like really with um, gut training or not? I'm not sure about. Right. Uh, and, the, and there's potentially going to be an impact, an environmental impact, if you put them in hot or humid or you know, some other yeah, exactly. challenge on the conditions. Yeah, that's because um, there is even less perfusion of the gut um, in the hot conditions because more uh, blood goes towards the skin. Um, so, yeah, that could be. Um, the, the prevalence much, should be much higher. So uh, in the discussion section, you had some theories about why your results were different. And that is super interesting. Can we go over those? Yeah, sure. Okay, uh, um, go ahead. So one of the really interesting uh, things uh, that happened was that blood glucose levels uh, were much lower when fructose was ingested. Um, so there are two participants that performed worse on the fructose glucose condition. Um, and there is one that performed like one is much worse and one is like marginally worse. Um, and this, um, participant that got much worse, his blood glucose levels dropped to 2.4 millimoles. So it's half of what is normal. And he was highly hypoglycemic. Um, and if you think about what uh, fructose should have done. Um, so filling up the liver glycogen stores, uh, this is kind of surprising a finding. 
um, which I can't really explain what happened and why um, blood glucose levels were too much lower. But clearly for this participant, it meant that um, he was hypoglycemic. I don't know whether this was one time thing. Uh, we should have repeated the trial um, on him, um, but he couldn't. Um, so this is like something um, that could be interesting, although like we know that there are no set um, values like in lactate threshold you've mentioned. So it's like four millimoles for some and uh, much higher for some. So even blood glucose can probably adapt. Um, but the other thing was interesting was that when they started this um, exercise, um, they were they tended to uh, people that had um, when they got participants got fructose, they tended to utilize more carbohydrates. So they actually burned more carbohydrates. So by the time that exercise um, turned into a time trial, um, they were utilizing the same amount of carbohydrates um, in both conditions when fructose was given and when glucose was given. Um, so the starting point might, ha might have been the same in terms of how much glycogen there was available. Uh, so even though they stored more glycogen with fructose, they have also uh, utilized more um, carbohydrates. Um, and yeah, during this hour, all the positive effects were just uh, negated. Um, Does that happen in general? The more glycogen you have, the more you use, you oxidize yeah, exactly. during exercise? Yeah, that's, that um, that's really common. So for example, it's a um, common thing to do for like before a race is people do a glycogen loading for three days, but they still train during those days. They do light training sessions, but even during those easy training sessions, they would probably be utilizing a lot of this glycogen. So um, I usually with athletes do only one day glycogen loading protocol just because of that because I assume that they would just utilize the glycogen and the uh, glycogen loading would be, um, multiple day glycogen loading would be pointless. Yeah, is it, a, is it necessary a bad thing? Is it bad, good, indifferent to have high oxidation rates of carbohydrate during exercise? Um, it's a tough question. Um, I think for performance, it's a good thing. So for example, if we take a look at the recent uh, attempt to break the two hour marathon record, um, they actually wanted Elliot Kipchoge to utilize as many carbohydrates as possible because for liter of oxygen, um, by utilizing carbohydrates, you get more energy out um, than utilizing fats. So in terms of like last climb of the race, you want to be utilizing carbohydrates but during the early, state, the early parts of the race, when the, uh, you're riding in the peloton, you actually want to utilize more fats because uh, you are saving the glycogen for later. Um, so it's a double-edged sword. Um, and this is something that we, I call uh, like, um, um, I can't, uh, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> I got lost. Um, uh, metabolic flexibility, so that a rider can actually be really good at is really good at switching from carbohydrate to fat uh, sources um, during exercise. So it's going to depend on the intensity of the exercise. Yeah, and also like probably the availability of carbohydrates around. So I found out in the lab when I was doing the experiments on my own that it's really difficult to switch from um, carbohydrates to fat. Whereas um, if you like don't ingest any carbohydrates in the beginning of exercise. Um, then it's much easier uh, to sustain longer efforts um, because otherwise, if you're just having all the time carbohydrates, um, then the carbohydrate rates, oxidation rates stay up and they don't drop. Um, and there is a lot of like, still, I think, many interesting questions that need to be researched in terms of like what is optimal. Um, so we have like, just case studies. I, not to back up too much, but when you were referring to the really low blood sugar levels in the people who were also ingesting the fructose, I noticed, or Nate pointed out to me a while back, you posted it, and it was a single study, and I don't know if there's further studies to back this up, but that fructo fructose can indeed be metabolized by muscle tissue. Is that correct? Oh, yeah. Um, 
That's true as well. So that's um, something that um, we were kind of started being interested uh, when we did studies in Galactose. I can't talk at the moment about those yet okay. uh, because they're not published, but um, fructose um, can be utilized by the muscle tissue, but only if the concentration in the bloodstream is really high, which never happens. Uh, so okay. if you're ingesting carbohydrates, glucose and fructose, fructose is never going to be really high. Uh, it would only be high if it was uh, injected directly into the bloodstream. Um, I see. If you just eat fructose, um, many people or most people get a lot of this um, gastrointestinal discomfort anyway. Um, so they just don't absorb the fructose alone. For that hypoglycemic thing, that actually, that happens to me. I'm hypoglycemic, so is my sister, so is my mom. And if I eat within a three hour window of working out, I can't do like a zone two ride. My, I start to physically shake and I just like wanna go to sleep. Uh, and if I do it three to four hours before and have a meal, I'm fine during it. So maybe that's what happened because the results for that person, they were almost 100% slower, right? Yeah. Like it was, it was insane. And you must've been there like, well, I'm so glad you measured the, uh, the glucose in the blood because uh, you'd be like, what's wrong with you? Did your dog just die? Like, like you know, what's the, what happened? Yeah, so, I think, go ahead. So the, the thing that I'm interested in now is um, what would have happened if people got glucose during the second exercise bout as well? Because we know that ingestion of carbohydrates maintains the um, blood glucose levels. Um, so had they have any carbohydrates, like 60 grams, 30 grams per hour, would um, blood glucose levels be normalized? Um, and then would this um, unlock the potential of having fructose um, during the subsequent exercise session? I don't know. Uh, this is something I'm really interested in. Um, and the other like interesting finding or a comparison between our study, the performance study and the capacity study was that this one hour steady state was at much lower intensity. And we kind of know that at lower intensities, we have a really high variability between like how much carbohydrates and how much fat you're utilizing. Whereas the higher the exercise intensity, the more carbohydrates you're uh, utilizing anyway. So it might have happened that this exercise intensity was so low that it allowed participants or people to actually have um, the carbohydrate oxidation rates so variable, whereas in the other two studies, studies they were almost the same. And this might have be the case because of the really high exercise intensity. So there are quite a few questions that we don't know about the, the answers to yet, but yeah. So what is your, what studies do you want to see next? Is it the the carbohydrate during the TT or yeah, is it I change the intensity? With, I right. would probably go with carbohydrates during the first hour and then a time trial. And then the other one would probably be really interesting was that um, was the one hour preload. So this one hour of moderate intensity exercise too long. Um, so what would have happened if the tri time trial was the first thing? Uh, so only like 30 or 40 minutes. Um, so yeah, these two things are probably the next questions we want to answer. So for our athletes listening, um, I think what here, here are some takeaways. You tell me if I'm going too far in any of this stuff. Okay. If you are doing a exhaustive effort that soon after a glycogen depleted effort, like four hours, it is probably beneficial to have a glucose fructose mixture. That one's correct? Yeah. If you are doing a time trial, like a really high capacity effort within four hours after a glycogen repeating. So this is my, this happens, uh, this could be a, a, in a stage race, you do a crit in the morning and then you have a TT that same day. That's very common in the US. You could take your fructose and maltodextrin mixture and Without, if you don't take carbs during your TT or right before, it looks like there'll be no performance improvement compared to just glucose. Is that correct? Yeah. But there yeah, might I be a performance so. increase if you take it during carbs during. 
yeah, I, I would recommend using the carbohydrates drink as well. Um, like even like 30 grams per hour would probably be enough. Um, just have something to maintain the blood glucose levels. Um, and okay. yeah, all the strategies first needs to, needs to be tested out um, to see if you become hypoglycemic like this participant had, um, has become. Um, um, you will know it straight away that you feel really bad. Yeah. Um, so the fructose and maltodextrin mix, that is probably not going to do any harm to you. There's probably a lower risk in gastrointestinal discomfort. And for exhaustive effort, there's evidence that it improves performance. So if you're going to choose one and you have the option, you should probably, uh, and what's what I'm going to do? I'm going to do fructose and maltodextrin because there's no downside and potential upside. Is that yeah. correct? That's yeah, exactly. What we know today. Yeah, that's, I think, like looking at the studies, we only have, um, so from our lab that we did two studies, we only had three participants that uh, performed worse on fructose glucose as compared to oh well, yeah as compared to um, glucose so most of the people performed better on fructose glucose mixture and the difference was besides that one outlier very small right yeah so the first study the capacity test uh, was huge i think it was more than 30 percent um whereas in our study the the difference was really small wow 30 percent capacity that is huge so for cape epic I am, I know it's 24 hours between stages, but I'm definitely going to do my fructose maltodextrin mix afterwards, because I think from the way that I race, that is going to be a capacitive effort every single day of like five and a half hours. Uh, Mr. Chad Timmerman, do you have any more questions for Tim? I don't think so. I think they all got answered um, really well, by the way, Tim. I do want to thank you for allowing us to call you Tim, because I'm sure at some point I would have called you Dr. Pajakar. I, I just know it was going to happen. <laughs> Thanks for having me. We're not very sophisticated as Americans. Uh, Tim, <laughs> is there anything else that you want to tell us about this study? And if not, can you please tell us again where we can reach you on social channels or follow you? Um, yeah, I mean, in science, um, probably the take-home message is that um, we have some we we've come to some conclusions, um, and these are like general guidelines. But we have to know that each participant or each subject responds differently on each day. Uh, so if like we give some guidelines, um, it doesn't mean that it will work for you every single time um, or work at all. Um, so you have to, I, I mean, I recommend everybody to test everything um, in advance. So before a race, before you come to, um, to do any like differences, changes in your diet. Um, so that's the take home message. And yeah, they, people can find me mostly on Instagram, but uh, they can also search for, for humanperformance.cc, which is going to be our new website um, that is going to be released very soon. And there are going to be some um, articles on this uh, topic as well. I think there is actually already one published on fructose glucose and glucose mixtures. So um, some take awesome. home messages are repeated there as well. Thank you. Well, thank you so much for your time, Tim. We really appreciate it. Um, everyone, if you want to learn more about what we do at Trainer Road, visit www.trainer.com or listen to our other podcast, Ask a Cycling Coach podcast. You find it on iTunes, uh, wherever, you, wherever you find your podcast, SoundCloud. Okay. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye. Thanks, everybody.